The epistle reading this morning is from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, which can be found in your pew Bibles on page 980. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they are, what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Well, our second reading today is from the Gospel according to St. Mark. And as we prepare to read that portion of God's word, let's take a moment to offer a prayer to the Lord. O oh God, we give you thanks today for your presence here with us as a church family gathered in different places, but together bonded by the love of your spirit. We thank you, O oh God, that even in the darkest of moments, and these moments are dark, that you are there. Even as we walk through the darkest valley, you are with us. You're there with us, giving us hope, filling each moment with meaning, giving us healing where it's needed, and pointing us toward your plans for us. Not only in this world, but in the place where we will spend the majority of our existence in eternity beyond this world. Bless us and give us strength as we meditate upon the wisdom in your word today. And through that, encourage us by your presence with us in all things, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're beginning in chapter 7 of St. Mark's Gospel. Uh, this is what we read. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they thoroughly washed their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what? Defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Well, 
three old friends who hadn't seen each other in years, they got together one day for lunch. The three ladies were talking about their careers and their lives when the topic of children came up. One woman said, you know what's funny? Back in 2002, my husband and I had just finished watching the movie about a boy when that very night I went into labor and gave birth to our first son. Well, another of the friends laughed. And she replied, you're kidding me. Years ago, some friends and I watched that movie Twins. And four months later, I gave birth to our twin daughters. Well, the third friend gasped. And she said, I just found out I was pregnant yesterday. And last week, I watched 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> Well, there are some things in life that aren't related, like movies we've watched and the number of children we have, or you know, losing our car keys the day before we watched Gone with the Wind, for instance. Uh, otherwise, we could solve all the world's problems by just listening to that Louis Armstrong song, What a Wonderful World Every Day. But um, there is... Unlike movies and children and things like that, there is a very strong connection in life between what we do and why we do it. A connection that affects the impact our actions have. Now, if, for instance, somebody does what's right, but they do it primarily because they're required or they're forced to do it, or they somehow want to advance their own self-interests. Well, others might end up benefiting to some degree from those good deeds, and that person might even end up with a nice, warm, and fuzzy feeling inside afterwards. But sadly, sadly, those good works, those good things, that they've done ultimately won't accomplish as much good as they could have accomplished and ironically in some situations might even end up causing harm rather than good. It seems strange but that's because when it comes to building God's kingdom good intentions are very much a part of what makes our actions good. Good intentions and good actions go hand in hand. And our scripture reading today is a perfect illustration of this. Uh, there are many throughout scripture, and, and this is one that really uh, brings it to the forefront. In our reading from St. Mark's Gospel, Jesus, he's having another one of those pleasant conversations with that group of religious authorities from Jerusalem that uh, we've talked about before, that group of primarily Pharisees who we read throughout the Gospels followed Jesus around during his ministry, being an overall pain in the patootie to him most of the time. Remember, we've discussed before that not all of the Jewish leaders in Jesus' society didn't like him or his teachings. Uh, we've discussed that before, which, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it's, it, it's very important because many actually deeply respected him. See, there's a misperception out there that all of the Jewish leaders, you know, it's sort of is, is one big conspiratorial block in Jesus' society. They, they didn't like him. They didn't like his teachings and they were against him and trying to trip him up. But according to scripture itself, that's just not the case. 
Uh, Jesus, for instance, throughout the Gospels, he, he often speaks in synagogues where he would have needed, according to Jewish custom, permission to speak from the local religious leader of each of those local Jewish gatherings. So there were a number of Jewish religious leaders, I would say probably even most of them who encountered Jesus, who not only liked Jesus, but trusted him and liked his teachings enough to allow him to speak in front of their congregations on the Sabbath in synagogue, at times from the pulpit, if you will. You know, the religious leaders we read about in the Gospels, like those today who harassed Jesus, they were a part of a small group from Jerusalem who had been corrupted by the latest power that had conquered the area, the Roman Empire, the, the Romans, uh, who were occupying Jesus' society at the time. Remember, historians tell us that the Romans normally didn't give political power to the religious leaders of the people that they conquered. They didn't like the outcome. Too many times these leaders would rally populations against them, so it was against their policy. They left the religious people out of political leadership. But they gave political power in Jesus' society in his day uh, to these religious leaders, this small group in Jerusalem, because of an extraordinary situation. One of their Roman political leaders, who was responsible for governing Jerusalem, he had some kind of a, a nervous breakdown. Uh, ancient Roman correspondence talks about him going in, insane. So they had to remove this guy from his political post, and they had no choice at the time but to depend upon some established Sadducees and Pharisees in the city to do some substitute gathering in his place. People knew these leaders, so they trusted them, and the Romans figured it was a good way to keep a revolt from happening. And it was some of these religious authorities, not all of the Jewish leaders and Jewish people, just some among this group in Jerusalem, who got big heads, I guess you could say, because of this newfound authority that they'd been granted. And they chose to go out from the city and use it to harass others they personally didn't like, uh, people they thought were a threat to their power, including Jesus. You know, they were like children who had been given a new toy by mom and dad that other kids didn't receive and who decided to hit one of their fellow rabbis, Jesus, over the head with the toy because they thought they were hot stuff. You know. And in our passage today, we see their latest juvenile act was to nag Jesus because some of his followers were eating with hands that the text describes in the Greek as koinos, which literally translated as ordinary. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, it meant that in this one instance, Jesus' disciples hadn't consecrated their hands through a prescribed water ritual before they ate with their hands. You know, hand washing was a number of washing rituals that were central to many Jews' faith in Jesus' day. In light of the coronavirus pandemic that we're going through right now, we can see why some of these ancient ritual guidelines in scripture, like this one, existed in ancient societies. People in that day, they didn't understand what viruses and bacteria were, but they knew that the general practice of people washing their hands before they ate kept them healthy, and they attributed this as rightly so, is a, is a gift from God, just as it is today. So God worked through these kind of rituals to protect people from things they didn't completely understand, uh, something faith still does today. You know, there are some in our world today who say, 
that religion is outdated and it's irrelevant. But I grieve for those who feel that way. Because faith still guides us through complex issues in this world and the next. That scientists, as bright and as you know, incredible as they are in their work, they'll never be able to analyze in test tubes. Because as smart as we humans think we are, there are some aspects of reality that we are just not capable of completely understanding. Like every other creature on earth, we have limits. And that's where faith picks up and guides us safely through it into eternity. So these washing rituals were very important in the ancient Israelite faith. Uh, there are actually detailed guidelines in four of the five books, first books of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, that talk about the ritual washing of clothes, hands, feet, and the human body, both inside and outside of worship. And St. Mark mentions some of these in our passage today. They protected people from unseen dangers, as I mentioned, but they were also a way for people to take something that was common, water, and use it to designate certain objects and activities as sacred, uh, which was uh, you know, a way to remind people that God was a part of their lives in worship and outside of worship. So you look, this bowl here, you know, it, it might seem ordinary, but it's not. God gave it to you. It's sacred. It's been consecrated through water. So be grateful for it. This is why we still practice baptism in our faith today. These washing rituals accomplished a lot of good in people's lives. But in our passage today, the way that this group of Pharisees from Jerusalem the way that this group of nincompoops was using these sacred rituals to demean Jesus, that was not good. Um, they were taking something that was holy and pure and benefited people's lives. And because of their intentions, they were twisting it and making something good they were making it bad. They were, weren't encouraging Jesus and his disciples to wash their hands because they were genuinely concerned about their well-being. They could have taken Jesus aside and addressed that issue privately if that was their intention. But instead, in our story, they decide to bring the issue up in front of Jesus' followers and others to again try to make Jesus look like an idiot and encourage people not to listen to his teachings. And that's why Jesus gets upset, you see. And he responds, quoting the prophet Isaiah, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. And then Jesus continues in verse 14, warning others what happens when people like those harassing him do good things for any other reason than a heartfelt desire on their part to serve God and to bless others. When he says, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile 
a person. And what's really, really cool here are these two Greek words that our Lord uses in verse 22 that are translated into our Bibles as the one English word, envy. Uh, the words literally mean hardship caused by the eye. So we can see what Jesus was getting at here. Um, uh, he's saying that when people honor God with their lips in order to look good through other people's eyes in front of others, and when their hearts are far from him, that doesn't accomplish good, but instead causes hardship. Hardship is caused by the eye. Now, these religious authorities, in other words, were encouraging Jesus to do a good thing so they look good in front of others in Jerusalem who saw them attacking Jesus. But the reasons they were encouraging him to do this good thing, those reasons were rotten to their core. And, and we can see the consequences in our passage. It accomplished nothing good for anybody. Their poor intentions literally transformed something that saved people's lives. These water rituals that, that purified people's hands and the, and the uh, uh, silverware and the other things that they used, the cookware that they used, into a way to mock God himself in Christ. The very thing that they were accusing Jesus' followers of doing because they weren't meticulously following every single one of these water rituals all the time. See, when our heart isn't right, that at the very least transforms the good we do into a shallow act that doesn't inspire others to follow our example. And at worst, it can turn people away from seeking God themselves because we're sending a message to others that Christians don't do good things because we genuinely care, but instead we do them for other selfish reasons, self-serving reasons, in order to elevate ourselves so that we can judge others or, or something along those lines. It's good intentions that are accompanied by good actions that ends up producing fruit that makes real, lasting changes in us, in the world around us, by attracting others to Christ. People see us and they think to themselves, you know, wow, that person genuinely cares. That's admirable. I want to be like him or her. This is the law of liberty that St. James talks about in our reading that Cindy read for us today. It's a, it's a way of following God's commandments that liberates people rather than making them feel oppressed. And when our hearts are right, it frees us to do the right thing, not because we have to, but because it benefits us. But because... It benefits others because we care, because we want to love and serve the Lord. So each time we do something good, our passages today challenge us to ask ourselves the question, what's the real reason why I'm doing this? Why am I doing this? Are my intentions as good as the actions are that I'm about to perform? Am I doing it because I really care about the person that I'm seeking to benefit? And if not, how can I change that? May God bless us and work through us to transform our lives and others' lives even during these challenging times as we take that principle to heart. Amen.